The same thing, then, could be said for psychology. If science is knowledge gained through observation and experimentation, psychology being that small section of knowledge about the mind and behavior that we can gain through observation and experimentation. I've put in brackets around behavior, and I'm a social psychologist, other psychologists will say differently. That's because I think what we're really studying is the mind. And part of why we include behavior is because you can't see a mind yet or touch one directly. But you can study behavior much more directly, and behavior gives us valuable insights into the mind. But it's more than behavior. Sometimes there are things that people don't do consciously. There are skin responses that they may have. Their body cells may react in a certain way. And by doing that, we also get at their mind. So it's not just the behavior, and it's really the mind that we're trying to look at, or that I'm trying to look at, at least. So you can say the same thing about psychology as you can about science. And this is just to point out that psychology is also, is also a huge topic. I have published a few papers on psychology. The person who supervised me during my doctorate has published hundreds of papers on psychology on a very similar topic. There are entire schools of people who publish thousands of papers, and this has all been done within the past 30 years. It's still very big. Psychology can be broken down, then, into many different fields. I do social psychology, which is the study of interaction. We normally say human interaction, but we would study how dogs and cats interact with each other if we had the time or the funding. And I'd study how dogs and cats interact with people as well. But there's also cognitive psychology, which is the study of mental processes. When I ask you, is an octopus a fish? How long does that take you? Why does it take you so long? And what does your brain do in trying to figure out what happens between the yes and the no and the maybe? Then there's developmental psychology, which is the study of the developing mind. What happens to our minds when we grow and when we change? What happens as we change from babies to toddlers to teenagers? So I'm sure there's a stage in there that I may have missed out, to adults to older adults. How do our minds change then? And then there's clinical psychology, which is the scientific study of ways of relieving or reducing psychological stress. Now, these are just four, and there are many other areas of psychology, but this is just to show you that psychologists are varied people, and we don't all study the same things. We take that huge chunk, and we split it up into many different things. So now that we've discussed what psychology is, it's only fair as well to distinguish between things that are psychology and things that are not psychology, but that are commonly confused with psychology. The most popular of those would be psychoanalysis which is a system of beliefs and a way of thinking developed by Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is, in many ways, the father of modern psychology and psychoanalysis in that many people have stood on his shoulders to develop the ideas that we have now. But psychoanalysis is not science. Sigmund Freud did not test his hypotheses the way that we test hypotheses now. Sigmund Freud reflected upon the nature of the human mind, his mind, I think, mostly, and other people's minds, and he arrived at conclusions. So it was a kind of philosophy, a kind of gaining knowledge through reflection, not through experimentation or observation in the way that we do it now. Another thing people commonly confuse with psychology is psychiatry. Now, psychiatry is a science, but it's not a scientific study of the mind. It's a medical science aimed at relieving medical conditions. So it looks more at the body or at the brain. Psychiatrists, for example, are more likely to want to use drugs, or they want to use physical interventions, whereas psychologists are more likely to look at therapies or things that affect the mind. That's not a clean black and white cut. It's not that simple. But it's just a way of understanding what the difference is between a psychologist and a psychiatrist, or a psychologist and a psychoanalyst. Either way, these two things are not psychology. And the last thing that psychology is not is personal opinion. And this is very tempting for many people. I've had frustrating conversations with people who say things like, oh, I don't really think that stress increases your blood pressure. Or, I'm not convinced that interacting with people from other groups makes you like them more. And they often cite an example, like I have an aunt who's very stressed and who has great blood pressure, or I've interacted with all sorts of people and I hate them. And that's all well and good. And we can understand the temptation, because psychology is a study of the mind. And we all have a mind. You have an individual mind that you've had for a very long time, and you're probably convinced that you know the workings of it. But what many people don't appreciate is that not all the workings of mind are conscious. In fact, arguably, many of them are not. A huge quantity of them are not. 
and that we spend an incredible amount of time and energy delving into the workings of the mind to understand it. And so when you've published 65 papers in a year on something and someone shows up and said, well, I don't think that's the case, to us it sounds a bit like going to a biologist and saying, I don't really think plants use chlorophyll, despite having never read or studied anything about it. It's just a pet peeve of psychologists, but it is an understanding that this is not science, and what we do is science, and it is psychology. So what do I do in psychology? After all this talk about observation and experimentation, what is it that I'm observing, and what is it I'm experimenting on? How do I draw my conclusions? I warn you, this is where it might get a little technical. There'll be numbers on the screen, and it might not be as flashy as before, but try to follow me about it. So one example of observations, that's myself, Keon West, and this is Miles Houston, who works in the Department of Experimental Psychology at Oxford University. And I shouldn't equate the two of us, because he's much more important than I am. So I should just say that in case he sees it. But this is a paper that we've written together, that we've submitted, and is currently being reviewed. So we're trying to figure out whether or not people are more motivated to conceal negative opinions or negative feelings towards black people than they are towards people with schizophrenia. This is assuming that people, some people at least, no people I know hopefully, but some people actually don't like black people and some people don't like people with schizophrenia. Is it fair to say that you're more motivated to pretend you like black people even if you don't than to pretend you like people with schizophrenia when you don't? So how do we do that? Well, the simplest way is just to ask people. That was our measurement. We developed a scale that I did not distribute to them myself, as that would have clearly skewed the results in one direction or another. And we simply asked them, how much do you feel that you need to hide negative reactions to black people versus need to hide negative reactions against people with schizophrenia? This is where the numbers get a bit funny. So having asked people how they felt about controlling their reactions to black people and controlling their reactions to people with schizophrenia, we then compare the measures that we get we just check whether or not they're the same, or whether or not they're different. We can't simply look at them, though, and say, oh, that's different, and move on. This has to be calculated statistically. And for those of you who are interested, we did an analysis of variance, which you can plug multiple variables in, multiple things that predict things, and multiple things that come out on the other end. And we did find, and I know that that probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but the smaller this number is, the better our findings were. And that number is very, very small. If you had a 1,000 of something, you still wouldn't have one of these. That's how small that number is. So that's just grand. And I think that that shows that there is a significant difference. And of course, the difference was in the direction that we predicted, that people were a lot more motivated to pretend they liked black people, even if they didn't, than to pretend they liked people with schizophrenia, even if they didn't. And so that was our conclusion. And so now you can see how we can make a statement about the way people think or the way people act, and we can back that up with data that we've collected. What's even more fabulous about this is that you don't have to agree with me. I have to write this up and I have to send it to a journal and put it in a paper. And then you get to, whoever you are, read that paper and say that you don't like something about my methodology or you don't like something about my statistics or my conclusions. And you get to write a paper about it. And that's how science always changes. And that's how we learn more and more about what's going on. In an experiment, which is different from just observing people, and this is another one that I did. Um, that's me again, Keon West, and that's that Miles Houston guy who's much more important than I am. And this is Emily Holmes, who's also much more important than I am, and she works in the Department of Psychiatry at Oxford University. This is a paper that we published this year. Um, the question that we wanted to figure out is, does imagining interacting with people with schizophrenia make you like them more? Now, we actually did four experiments, but in order to do that, we actually had to manipulate people. That's not a negative kind of, or an, an unpleasant kind of manipulation. No, this is a good manipulation where we make you do something um, that we want you to do, and then we see what comes out at the end of it. What we did was we manipulated half of the people to imagine an interaction with someone with schizophrenia, and the other half imagined an interaction that didn't involve someone with schizophrenia. So they were doing almost the same thing, but that little thing was changed. And what did we find? So you can see there, this time I used a simple t-test, which works simply by comparing two values, one to the other. As you can see, this number is also quite small. And anyone who's in the know would know that this number needs to be smaller than 0.05 for that to work, which means that this wouldn't occur any more often than once in 20 times if this were just to happen by chance, which it is there. 
we did find that people who imagined interacting with people with schizophrenia were more pleasant towards them, or said they would be more pleasant towards them, than people who hadn't done that imaginative exercise. We actually did this experiment four times, just to make sure that we knew what we were talking about. So we could safely arrive at the conclusion that yes, just by imagining interacting with someone with schizophrenia, you can actually like them more, or you can change your attitudes towards them. Again, you don't have to agree with that, um, and there's no way you should agree with that just by seeing three bullet points on a slide. But what you can do is you can then go look it up in a journal, see when it was published, see who wrote it, look at my methodology, look at the statistics, look at the conclusion, and say, that makes sense, or you haven't actually demonstrated this at all. And that's how we keep rolling forward. So in conclusion, the question was, is psychology really a science? First of all, you have to answer, what is science? What is a science? We say science is that body of knowledge gained through observation and experimentation. And what is psychology? Psychology is a science of the mind and, of course, of behavior. It's that body of knowledge about the mind and behavior that we can gain through observing and through experimentation. With that, thanks very much. I'm Dr. Keon West of the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds.